podcast. Today we have on Howie Mann from Quick Commercial Capital here to talk about commercial loans. So hi, Howie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Becky. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm glad you were able to join me. Um, so tell me just a little bit about who you are as a person and a little bit about what's going on in your life. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, I, um, I'm, this is like my second time around because I had owned a copier company for 20 years. And in 2016, I sold the copier company. I retired for about a week. I really failed <laughs> at retiring. I really did. I don't know how people do it. I can't do it. I've got way too much energy. I love doing triathlons with friends and family. I'm very, very active. So I tried to find something I can do where there's what I believe would be a void in our economy today. And what that is, is lending money to businesses and also providing commercial mortgages because banks have been inundated with applications. They, they don't know what to do with them. And if you're at all not up to their qualifications or standards, you're going to get refused. So what I've done is I put together a network of lenders across the country. And what we do is we help people get the land or property or mixed prop, mixed use properties. I do satellite dishes. I just closed on a soccer field. I'm refinancing a church. I'm doing a Chabad, which if you're not Jewish, you might not know what a Chabad is, <laughs> but it's a very religious Jewish organization with very, very, very affluent um, congr congregants. And they huh. have the money to do what they want to do. And they're really taking over the South Shore of Long Island. Um, and they're good people. They mean well. Um, but like I said, they're trying to build new buildings and I'm helping them with those. That's really cool because there are, even with just how you described it, it, there is so much that really you do with the way that like you lend money. So let's start very simple and very basic here. What is a commercial loan? Okay. Put simply, um, and I'll state about a commercial mortgage because mm -hmm. that's what your viewers are looking for. If you're not living in that piece of property or that building, you're not taking up 51% or more of that property, it is considered commercial, okay? If you're taking up more with your family or what have you, it's a residential. And mm -hmm. I have to train people to understand that commercial mortgages are a completely different animal than residential. Residential, you can close in a week, not a mm -hmm. difficult thing. And that's the one where you would hear when they quote mortgage rates of 2.7, three point, whatever. Um, so our owner occupied, really that primary residence of the exactly. person buying. Primary those are the people that right have those, the, those are the people that have those really low interest rates, especially right now, but it's really, you are living in it. That is your personal home. That is your primary residence. That right. is that residential mortgage right. that we're, that a lot of us are familiar with when we're buying a place for us to live in. Right. But what you do then is for people that are not in that property, that 51% of the time. Yeah, they're looking for it as an investment property. And what I do being a broker, I'm not one bank and mm -hmm. every bank has different qualifications and I will take my clients, if I see their credit is good and the tax returns are really nice, I'll take them to a smaller bank. And the smaller bank will offer the same SBA rates than the larger ones, but they'll get it through for you in say two to three months, whereby a huge, a, a major, I would say brick and mortar banks that we all know of that I don't wanna mention names here, are going to take four or five and six months to close for you because they're so busy and mm -hmm. they are understaffed. And I saw that firsthand when they tried to do PPP plans. They, the banks came to me and said, Howie, can you please help us? And I, as a micro lender, was able to put my clients for PPPs through an SBA portal. Um, but getting back to the commercial mortgages, Becky, um, again, I'll not only put them through a smaller bank, but these banks are kind of revolutionary in the thought that they will actually pay me. I don't have to charge my client, which is wonderful. Everybody wins. I always recommend in Lady Landlords that people talk to brokers. And the reason for that is, as you said, that is something that we as the buyer do not pay for, which is fantastic. And we have somebody that is the expert in what these loans look like, go out and really kind of shop around for the best loans for us. So I'm happy to hear that you are doing that then for the commercial loans as that, as that broker because that really is the best service for all of us to have. So, and I said the exact same thing, especially with the way that our, our current market is, that people should be looking into some of those different smaller banks. It is the larger banks that are just not as, as flexible with different things going on. So that's fantastic that you've a network. So now you said across the country, 
So are you able to lend in, in all 50 states? Yes, and we are doing it. I mean, I've done um, lend loans in California. Um, I've lend in Georgia, um, big in New Jersey right now. So any state that you come to, I have a network of private lenders that are partners with me and we mm -hmm. share. We, as I say, we play nice in the sandbox together because everybody is mindful of each other. We know exactly what we're up against and we share deals. So if I do a deal out of state, I'll usually find somebody. I have somebody in Atlanta that I give a lot of business to and he's okay. very grateful um, you know, for mortgages. Perfect. So that's fantastic that someone can come to you. And I'm going to put your information down in our show notes here. And also members can find your information on our on the lady-landlords.com website to reach out to you. So that's fantastic that no matter where our listeners are in the United States, that they can reach out to you, Howie, to make sure to get the help that they need. So if someone is buying a multifamily that they plan on not living in, or actually then even a single family that they are not living in, so we're still talking that residential property. We're still talking a single family or under that five unit kind of mark. Is that exactly. a person that would still come to you for that commercial loan since they will not be living in that property or would they still go for more of a traditional loan? No, they can come to me for that. I have a gentleman who I partner with on the South Shore. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned the Chabad, by the way. And he's, a, <laughs> he's a member of the Chabad and he gives me commercial mortgages and I give Ron the actual residential mortgage. So anything like you said, up to one to four family, I give to him, that's more residential. Gotcha. Over four family, I do. And what I wanted to state before I forget, Becky, is that as a broker, we make it so simple for the client. The, mm -hmm. the bank will bury them in paperwork. We make it so simple. We give them a, a personal financial statement to fill out. We give them the form. We ask them for two or three years of their tax returns. We ask them for an approximation of their credit score and we guide them. We, what happens is when somebody's looking for a mortgage, I tell them, do not cancel a credit card, do not <laughs> open the credit card. I made the mistake. I'm in the business and I, I made this mistake. I bought carpeting for a unit I own in Manhattan and I recarpeted it at Home Depot and it was $3,200. And they said, Howie, would you like to open an account with Home Depot? And I'll save you 10%. So I yeah. said, okay, I'll save $320. Next thing I know, I get my visa statement about three weeks later, and I say, oh, my credit score went down from 825 to 778. I said, what happened here? And visa said, did you open up a credit card? I said, yes, I did. They said, then don't worry. In three, four weeks, it's going to go back up. But this is so important for any real estate investor to understand. You need that mortgage. You do not want to change your credit score in any way because you know what's going to happen? You're going to lose that property to another yeah. buyer. So That's, free, freeze, don't do anything. That is so funny that you told that story. I actually had what I'm going to still refer to as a nightmare that I woke up this morning saying to my husband, oh my God, did I open a Home Depot credit card? That was, <laughs> that was actually, that was my nightmare last night <laughs> that we were in the process of looking for our next property. And I totally screwed it up because I opened a Home Depot, I opened a Home Depot credit card. God. So but, but that is something that's incredibly important. We don't necessarily need those big purchases. It is not the time to go re, to go lease a car. I had it is not the time. car broke. The car literally broke. He needed a new car. I said, don't do it. Rent a car for a couple of weeks. Don't buy something new. So Exactly. Yeah. No, all those things, like they are, when you're going through that buying process, you are asked consistently for your statements. And you always hear the story about the, the family that was so close to closing on their house. So they went, they bought their furniture, they opened, you know, the Bob's discount credit card or whatever oh, it might God. be. And then all of a sudden, then they weren't able to close, yet they have a ton of property, but now they have this, all this furniture that they just bought, but right. they can't actually close on the property because they spent that money. They opened different accounts and they really changed what they were already, what the underwriter was already approving them for. Yeah. So that's a really good point to make sure to bring up, um, to make sure to kind of get these things closed. So the people that are coming to you then for commercial loans, they are people that are looking for those larger apartment complexes that once again, that five and above. So now we're really talking that commercial property, things that are not going to be owner occupied. And then I'm assuming also then those other, do they come to you also for those like commercial spaces? Like, let's say I want to buy, um, what used to be a car dealership, maybe like that type of building or an old like grocery store, or since we're both New Yorkers here, you know, that bodega space, 
more of that, that commercial property, you are also the person to kind of go to if you're looking to buy something that is not that residential property. Yes. I mean, it, that's a very good question, Becky. And it leads me into another kind of suggestion as a broker I can offer to the lately landlords. You, you want to look for a property that's at least 75% occupied. You mm -hmm. want to have that rent roll and you want to have that rent roll of, of tenants that have one or more year leases in place. And it's okay if you got if you drop lower than that 75% mark, that's fine if those tenants are paying you a lot of rent because it gets okay. down to dollars and cents with the bank. And so they'll be a little more flexible if one tenant is paying as much as maybe three or four wood in another building. So mm -hmm. it's, they're flexible in that way. But those are the kind of things I leave people. As soon as somebody says, I have a building, can you help me? I want to know facts. I don't want to waste their time. It's been, going to be very hard for them to buy a vacant building unless they're moving in. Maybe they're moving their whole business into that building. Yeah. So if they come to you with a vacant property, but let's say it needs a ton of work. So we're going to refine, we're going to um, renovate it and rehab it. Is that something that you would take into consideration or is that considered riskier for that loan? Because we now there has to be a whole bunch of work done and costs incurred before it can start producing income. Well, it's funny. One of the questions are, what is your plan? What is your end all plan? <laughs> And okay. the banks want to know the story and the lenders want to know the story. There's a story behind everything. What do you, what's your plan for this? After you're all done, what's your plan? What's your skin in the game? It's so funny when you go for a residential mortgage, you can put as low as 10% down, but the LTV loan to value with commercials different. I mean, you have to put down 30, 35%. I had somebody with a cannabis greenhouse in California for $60 million and he gave me the architectural plans. He spent a fortune. And I said, Sam, do you have $18 million liquidity to put down? He says, no, I don't have $18 million. I said, this isn't going to happen then. You have to put skin in the game. I love that you brought that up. That was actually one of my questions for you. A lot of times we hear with creative financing type strategies, the hard money lenders, the private lenders, commercial lenders, that we always kind of hear, oh, well, they'll just give you all the money you need or a business loan. They'll just give you all the money that you need. So I'm really happy to hear you say that. Um, that it is something that we still need to have that down payment. We still need to have that skin in the game. So for commercial mortgages, you're saying that 30% tends to be the average? Yeah, around, yeah, yeah. Okay. That would be the average. Um, we also do something I did last month. There was a foreclosure on this mm -hmm. doctor who was a landlord building in Harlem. And mm -hmm. the tenants just stopped paying her because the COVID, they weren't working. They had no money. And I said to the doctor, you know, we can do this. I got her a hard money refi from um, a hard money lender at 12%. So it wasn't so bad. Um, and she had to pony up $5,000 at, at the table, at which she came up with. And she saved her buildings. So if any landlords are out there and they go, oh, no, <laughs> I want to be foreclosed on this property. Don't think it's the end of the world. Give me a call. I can walk them through it and I can get them a little higher rate. Now, again, you could refinance that 12% when mm -hmm. things clear up and your tenants begin to pay you again. You're not but locked into it. I would rather pay that 12% than to lose my, I mean, if we're talking once again, a brownstone in Manhattan, we're talking a couple million dollars here. Yeah. So I would rather pay the 12% for maybe the next six months, another year mm -hmm. compared to 5%, right? It's not like I'd be paying zero anyways. I would right. rather a little bit of a higher interest rate to still be able to to, to have my my property, this building, this, once again, talking a brownstone, we're talking at least a million dollar asset. Right. So, and then there are then options to kind of go. I feel like that's something that a lot of people get very scared about. Is there like, like when you said 12%, I'm sure that some of our listeners out here were like, oh my God, he said 12%. Like that's, that's impossible for me. But I always relate that to either whatever your interest rate is, or also once again, both of us being New Yorkers, we have very high taxes here. People find it crazy when I tell them that my, with my properties combined, we probably pay over $40,000 a year in taxes. Yeah. But do I actually pay that $40,000 in taxes? No, I don't because I still have a cash flowing property that will cover what those taxes actually are. So same thing, I can still afford that 12% or even a 15% because it doesn't matter as long as the rest of the numbers work around that. And for this woman here, okay, maybe she had to take a little bit of a loss or a little less cash flow, especially if you're saying these tenants aren't paying now due to COVID and some of the restrictions, especially here in New York, but it's okay to take a little bit less money because you're still making money, right? right? You still have your asset. 
Right. So when I'm going to come back to you on a question with interest rates shortly, but when people call you and come to you, I heard you say that they really need to share like the plan, the story of what they're doing. Do you expect like a full business plan, like a PowerPoint presentation, a Word document being, or just really an idea of what the exit strategy and the way to make money really is for that property? You nailed it. You nailed it, Becky, when you said exit strategy. That's what they want to hear. Are you you just somebody who's philandering and saying, uh, taking a shot in the dark and trying to make profit and you have no idea what you're doing and it's your first rodeo? They don't Mm -hmm. want to, especially to fix the flips. I mean- they're very strict. They don't want first time fix and flippers. I do have a lender for those people, but their okay. rates are going to be a little higher. Um, Which makes sense. Yeah. So yes, the exit strategy is important. When you said you said a um, a business plan, it's very interesting because I work very closely with the SBDC in Farmingdale Small Business Development Center, and they have all startups, and this, they'll send the startup to me for money because they're just new. I put a drugstore in business. I put a personal trainer in business, and they need a business plan. But it's really wonderful because this particular um, nonprofit agency does the business plan for them. And that's something that there are small business administrations in every city across the United States. When I started my first business, I think probably my second or third business, actually. When I started my second or third business in New York in health coaching, I actually found the small business administration in New York City. And I went to all their classes. They had a ton of classes about how to create a business plan, how to run social media, how to do marketing, all those really nice basics. And they also gave you access to counselors to help build a business plan. They give you access to an attorney to ask just some basic questions to for Mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. They gave you an accountant that you can ask some questions to for free. So definitely, if you're not familiar with the SBA, the Small Business Administration, it is definitely something that you want to go to Google look in your area, ladies, and see what resources you have that can help add into your real estate investment business. And once again, that's Howie, that's great that they that you are able to work with those first timers. That is a big issue for a lot of our members is I haven't done this necessarily before. How do I kind of get that resources? Who is possibly willing to give me a chance? So it's great to know that there are people that will give you that chance. But once again, there's kind of a little bit of a cost of entry into that. I'm going to throw you a little bit about a curveball here because I think maybe some of the lady landlords would be very interested in hearing this. You can also redirect your IRA. So in other words, there are companies, a company called Next Generation for $350 a year. What they will do is they'll help you. Say you have a huge amount of money in an an IRA and you Mm -hmm. want to use that IRA and self-direct it to real estate. You set up an LLC You advertise in Albany or something. You must advertise some publication somewhere in the country for $250. And then you have now an LLC and you can funnel your IRA money into this account and use it and not get taxed as if you would just take money for an IRA to pay your bills or buy a car. So So you're not getting those penalties. You're no penalties, Becky. So that's just a hint that a broker like myself might bring to you. It's a value that we add. Okay, we're a team. I'm representing you. You are my client and I'm representing you to get you the loan you need. And that's using that pass. That's something that our ladies can do to then fund that down payment, that 30% that we talked about. Exactly. Now we're taking out that money that we already have sitting in that IRA account, but we're able to put it to use at this time, but we're not then getting penalized on it. So a lot of people out there are kind of like, well, I don't have that liquidity. I don't have that money just sitting in a bank account. But you know what you do? If you have it in an IRA, that could be your answer to how to utilize that money. So Howie, that's a great tip. Um, We do have ladies that use that strategy, but I'm so happy that you brought that up as a great way to fund that down payment. And Becky, any financial planner will tell people to diversify their holdings. I mean, you can have it in stock, you can have it in bonds, but you know, real estate's such an important thing. They're not making any more real estate. That's basically what somebody told me. There's just so much. No more land. No more land. That's what I meant. So, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's it's a wonderful opportunity to not, like Becky said, get penalized and use that money to your best fee. We have. So someone's coming to you now. They're going to give you a call. They have this property in mind. They say, hey, this is my exit strategy. Now, do they need to have an LLC in order for the banks that you work with to lend to them? Or do or can they or do they not need that LLC? Will some will they be lent their money personally? You could do it personally, but it's better for you to have an LLC simply because you're protecting yourself from getting sued and your private, all of your private holdings 
are basically um, exposed to, to somebody who's living in that property. They can go after you. So that's why any accountant will say to you, any real estate attorney will say to you, please, <laughs> please, please. Set just, and it's not expensive. I mean, it's less than a thousand dollars. Now you have an LLC that you're putting all of your business into. I mean, contractors, they have, every time they start a new project, they open up a new LLC with a new checkbook. So yeah. it, it's something that's done every day. No, no. And that's incredibly important. We do have an entire episode on the Lady Landlords podcast about why LLCs are important. So ladies, if you have not listened to that episode, make sure to go back and look for that episode on why it's important for you to have an LLC. So that's nice to know, though, that they don't necessarily have to have it. They should. Right. We all agree that you should. Right. But it's nice to know because also some one of the main questions that we also get is, well, what time do I need that to open that LLC? So someone can also call you and say, hey, I have, this is my plan. This is my exit strategy. This is what I'm looking for. But they can then open that LLC at that time, right? They don't need to, they don't, we don't need to be opening LLCs this year if we plan on investing in five. It's the same theory, Becky, as a person having an umbrella policy of insurance. Somebody mm -hmm. slips and falls, somebody has a car accident, something where you're liable. You don't want to tap into your savings and hopefully that person will accept whatever your umbrella policy for. Is it a million? Is it two million? And, and you'll say, this is it. And the courts will say, hey, how much more you want? This, this, you're getting this person's umbrella policy coverage. Exactly. Nope. LLCs are important. Umbrella and policies. Once again, you can check out our episode about your legal structures or also our insurance episodes to learn more about those. So Howie, what else do people need when they come to you? What else should I have prepared? You had mentioned a couple of things with tax returns. Tell me what I should have ready when I give you a call to ask okay. for this type of mortgage. We keep it as simple as possible because we don't want to inundate people with paperwork like the banks do. And I know what the banks need. And I say to the banks, listen, please, if you want more business, you got to simplify this for people. <laughs> so one of the first things the banks going to want is three years of your personal tax returns which is not difficult because your accountant probably has that on hand for you. That's and really- everything's easy. electronic in these, yeah. these days. And put that into a PDF. Now we're already into July of this year. So they're gonna want interims. And again, it doesn't have to be formal. It could be your accountant might have it on QuickBooks, whatever that is. So that takes care of that. They'll also, believe it or not, they want a photo ID. They wanna know, you know what you, what you were born, what your social security is and that. They also want to know that you're a U.S. citizen or at least a national. Okay? okay, if you're not a U.S. citizen or a national, we cannot get you a mortgage. I had, okay. an, I had an Egyptian guy the other day, wasn't a citizen, wasn't a national, and he had diplomatic Im immunity here. So nobody really is going to lend him money. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so getting back to the tax returns, I have a personal financial statement I ask you to fill out. I want to see the last three business or personal bank statements that you have. And I need every page. They're very, very funny about okay. that. They want to see every page. People just send me a, a couple of pages. It's not going to work. And then if you have a credit report on yourself, that's great. Well, we can take an approximate. And what we'll do is if it gets close and we see what we like, we'll do what's called a soft pull. So again, okay. the soft pull of your credit is not going to hurt your credit score. I've had people come to me and they're shopping. And unfortunately, by the time they get to me, their credit score has been like 120 points down because yeah. inconsiderate lenders are doing hard pulls on your credit. And every mm -hmm. time that's done, similar to Home Depot, your credit score is going down. So be very specific. If you don't speak to me and you speak to another broker, say, listen, whoa, I want to make sure you're not doing a hard pull. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, that's number one. So to, to just summarize tax returns, personal financial statement, I'll give you a blank form, three last three months of bank statements and a photo ID. It can't be simpler than that. Gotcha. And once again, that hard pull is okay. Once you make the decision, once we oh, decide we're moving they forward, have to do a hard pull. That's then fine. that hard pull will be done, needs to be done. And but up until that point, make sure that you're asking lenders, is this a soft pull or hard pull? Because once again, if that's going to affect your credit so significantly, you don't want to end up not getting a property because you weren't sure if a lender was doing a soft pull or a hard pull. Now, for those that are self-employed, 
do you then need those three years of tax statements will still will still work showing that they are self-employed so it doesn't matter necessarily if they're w-2 or self-employed doesn't matter okay but three years right you're fine with that um and you know that and there as you get closer people always want to know how much cash do i need what's my liquidity now the ltv is going to be 30 percent. you're going to have to show up at the table with that you're going to have to also, this is not a residential appraisal. It's going to be six, $700. This is a commercial appraisal, which is going to be two to $3,000. And also every bank wants an environmental phase one, which is going to be another $2,000. That, Howie. Or, yeah. And if you're near a gas station, okay, they're going to want to maybe do even phase two. They have to test the soil around the property. And it's really for your behalf. I had a guy just yesterday said, Oh no, this lender's waiving appraisal. I said, nobody waives appraisal because number one, the bank wants to know how much it's worth. And number two, you should know how much it's worth. Why would you want to buy a building for a half a million dollars if it's worth 350? Don't you want to know? So again, when somebody says you don't need an appraisal, you tell them, thank you very much. Have a good life because they're not, they're not helping you. Gotcha. So we have appraised. So when we talk then fees associated with these, with this type of loan, we would have an appraisal fee. And once again, we're talking a couple grand, much mm -hmm. higher than our residential mortgages. Yeah. We're talking, you said an environmental. So that's just testing soil, the environment around then that commercial property. And that's always done. Yeah. Okay. And what's the cost typically for that? Well, the first one is another, say two to $3,000. Okay. okay. If they want to do a phase two, that could be another six to $7,000. So you, you really want to make sure that what you're looking at right now is not anywhere near a tank in the ground um, of any sort, because yeah. because then you're going to have to do. Th but you know what? When people, Becky, is speaking about buying a one to two million dollar property that's fully rented and it's it's show, it's giving off so much income, they don't want to be penny. Uh, they don't want to be penny wise pound foolish and say, you know what? I don't want this property because it's going to cost me fifteen thousand dollars up front. Completely agreed, right? We can't, that's a very great way to say it. We don't want to be like, oh, well, I have to pay $2,000 for appraisal, so I'm okay not making the $100,000 in this property, right? right exactly. Uh, <laughs> we want to understand that there's going to be fees associated with absolutely everything, but we have to incorporate that into when we're analyzing our deals and making decisions after the properties that we're going to go after. So we have the appraisal fee, that environmental fee, the down payment. What other costs would a buyer then be expected to come out of pocket for? Well, title insurance. Title which insurance in New York is a must. Florida doesn't care, but New okay. York you have to have it, um, and that's so important because you don't want to buy a property and two years later somebody says, "Hey, I have a title to this. I I own this property." You go, mm -hmm. "Oh my God, what, what happened here?" So that's what's yeah. so important to have a good title company doing a whole search of the property. Um, again, I hate to keep saying it, but probably about fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars for title okay. insurance, mm -hmm. um, but. but Necessary. It's worth it. And, and it's not only necessary, it's mandatory. In, exactly. In Depending yeah. on your state, make sure to check what your, what your um, regulations are for title insurance. Um, but once again, even if it's not required in your particular state, ladies, it is probably a good idea. And once again, we're talking large properties. We're talking commercial properties here. It's kind of worth the extra fifteen hundred to right. grand right. to make sure that you actually will be the rightful owner of that property. And here's um, another thing, Becky, when you go to a bank for a mortgage, the mm -hmm. bank wants to have a relationship. And mm -hmm. I call the relationship like almost like white collar blackmail because they're <laughs> going to say to you, listen, we don't only want to do this mortgage because believe it or not, they're not making a lot of money on the mortgage. Okay. They want you to be with them, put your business holdings with them. And then, and only then they might approve you with my smaller banks who are just into real estate. They don't care if you bring all your money over to them. That's gotcha. a big plus for anybody who has a relationship already with a bank. They don't want to leave that bank they know from so many years. Yeah, that's really important. And also that's something that not all of our listeners are looking to build, you know, these huge empires where they're going to be build it, buying 10, 15 commercial properties. Right. They might be looking for one here or there. They're going to be looking for, you know, maybe a few, but that's typically a little bit more of the norm. There definitely are going to be some of our listeners out there that are going to want to buy every property they can get their hands on. But in general, really people are looking to have a couple of different properties that are going to be able to replace their incomes. And that's something you can usually do in a lot less um, properties. So that is nice to know that they can still have that relationship with a bank through one property. 
So exactly. And I, you know, I always tell people, call me before you go down that road and spend all that time, call me. And I will tell you if this is a viable piece of property or building to purchase. Um, okay. I'm doing this for years now. And I, I, I've seen so many instances where people spend so much time, they, they just fall in love with something. And I tell them, you know, <laughs> not good. I mean, it's not going to work. <laughs> not, it's not going to work. So, and yeah, even gas stations, people want to buy a gas station. And the problem with the gas station is it's very risky. So almost no banks will do a gas station. And the lenders that will do it, Becky, they want to make sure that the convenience store is bringing in the money. The gas stations really? don't make a hell of a lot of money. You think because prices go up with gas, they're not making a lot of money on the gas. They're making money on the convenience store and the repairs that they do. Oh, huh. I, 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 as a as a person in New York that rarely ever drives, I that would never have crossed my mind. Yeah. Um, but interesting. I feel like one of the other businesses that you hear often about that I feel like would actually be difficult would be laundromats. Again, when we're talking about that environment, hundred percent, because a lot of laundromats are bringing in chemicals and they're doing their. It's not enough that they have the change that you throw in the the, the wash machines. They have a folding service. They have a dry cleaning service on the side. So again, that's going to be a difficult loan to make. But again, that's why you come to myself as a broker. I have private lenders that are so spe specialized. I have one guy for bakeries. I have one guy for pizza parlors. I have oh. one guy for car washes. You name it, I've got that guy that's going to get you the money. That's what they specialize in. Yeah. And, and really making, which is great then because then they are in a position to know the right questions to ask when really looking at those properties to make sure that it's going to be that wise investment. Now, do you recommend that people reach out to you and establish that relationship when they find like a property and they have like an address and are like, cool, I want to buy that pizza shop on, you know, South Broadway or more of, hey, I want to go this direction. I'm still looking for a property. Do you re recommend that they would reach out to you before they have a specific address? or when they finally identify the property that they want to buy? Before, absolutely before. before. I can lay the groundwork for them. I can tell them what they need to have ready to go because it's so competitive right now, Becky, for a good piece of property. If my, my buyer is not ready to go with all the information they need, even a day or two could cause them to lose that property. Wow. And is that because other people are going after those same property? Like, is it kind of like what yeah. we're seeing in the residential market right 100%. now? 100%. Same thing. It's very bare out there right now and commercial too for a good property. Huh. And is that, how do you think that has, with COVID over the past year, with so many businesses kind of closing, we had a lot, especially here in New York, we had these like historic properties that had been in the city for 40, 50, 60 years actually close. So to me, I figured that there would actually be more commercial space for sale, a lot of people are kind of thinking, rethinking if they even need a brick and mortar type office when they've been working from home for so much, for a year plus now. But you're saying that the commercial market is just as crazy as kind of this residential market right now? Oh yeah, I mean, the landlords, like you mentioned, the businesses that are you know, the, leaving the buildings are not the building owners. The owners are not gonna give up that property. They're just gonna bite their lip and bear it and, and hope that this, this changes soon and people will come back. So just because you see empty spots doesn't mean that, you know, they'll want to sell that property. That those landlords aren't saying, well, since I have this strip mall and two out of four of my, my stores are kind of empty right now, those landlords are still wanting to hold on and retain it. And just kind of like us with multifamilies, we're, you know, that are, have tenants maybe that are possibly not paying. We're hoping we're going to kind of see it through and still be able to hold on to a property. You're saying these commercial landlords are still in that same position saying like, no, people are going to come back to my strip mall. They're going to be opening restaurants and barber shops and the nail salons, like everything's going to be back to being opened and those services are still going to be needed. But you know, it's interesting you brought that up, Becky, because it's not a bad idea for a lady landlord to approach somebody like that, because that particular woman or man that owns that building, they could be on the fence. Yeah. And rather than them going to a broker who wants to sell the building for them, they can avoid that broker fee and your lady landlord could be in the right place at the right time and say, listen, I can make this easy for you. Are you looking to sell? And I used to tell my children when they were looking for jobs, don't look in the want ads for jobs. Go find yeah. a company you want to work for and call them. And when they have the opening, they'll call you back, that kind of thing. So go hunt Go hunt for those properties right now. So that was a good idea. In fact, you see empty spaces, places, the stores are all empty. Find that landlord and say, hey, the owner and say, hey, are you looking to sell right now? 
Yeah, we talk about that in commercial real estate with that idea of like driving for dollars, right? Which is kind of outdated. <laughs> People are usually looking online and, you know, are doing skip tracing and, you know, searching that way, making phone calls. We're not necessarily out um, knocking on doors, right. but we, we still can. And the whole concept with that, however you want to antiquate the term, is really just saying, go out and make a deal happen. If you're seeing signs, reach out to that person. Networking is a huge part. And I kind of like what you're saying, you know, don't go Google like, hey, I want a job in this. Go out and figure out how you can be an asset to that company, in your example, with, with your children looking for a job, or how you can be an asset to a seller, whether if it's a commercial property or a rental property, and, and figure out how you can solve that person's problem. Maybe they made it through COVID and are saying, you know what, I don't want to get back to being a commercial landlord. I am over this. I am stressed. I lost all my hair. Like I don't want to deal with these things anymore. They might be willing to kind of work with you. And then once again, it sounds like that might you might be able to kind of put a deal together that way just as you would if you were cold calling um, people that are that are looking to sell their house or trying to avoid a foreclosure. So there are definitely a ton of different ways to make those things happen. Um, Howie, any other tips that you have for our ladies today about commercial loans? I would say to them to address their, their monetary value, what they have, what they want to invest and say, listen, here's a million dollar property. But here are three properties, maybe three fifty, three and a quarter each. I know it's a lot more work, but why put all your eggs in one basket? I would tell you, go buy more properties for your money because they're going to appreciate higher. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Hey, success comes with headaches, ladies. There's nothing easy out there. So I'd rather see you with two or three properties than one, because if one goes south, you got nothing to fall back on. So I would say, Becky, in, 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 if we're finishing up here, Mm -hmm. Tell the lady landlords and stress this, buy more properties. <laughs> I love it. And I totally agree. Um, I'm looking for my next one too. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And we hear all the time about people that are afraid to kind of over leverage. So I actually love what you're saying is, well, remember that, well, if one goes south, then at least you have something else. So at least yeah. then it's not like, okay, well, I had the one, but now it's gone. Now I have zero, but at least then you could still say, well, I still have other other cash flowing properties, other income producing properties. So Howie, thank you. I love the idea. Go out, buy more properties. I will make sure to have down in the show notes, you can find Howie's information there to reach out to him to get the ball rolling on any commercial mortgages that you do need help with. And if you are looking for any type of help specifically with the deals that you are looking for, please make sure to look into the Lady Landlords Roadmap Program, which is a three-hour session with me where we can talk about the specific details you need to make sure to buy those more properties. So, Howie, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. And ladies, I will see you back next week for the next episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast.